So in this video, we're going to be studying the Biagra loading of a representative volume element as shown here. And that means that we're going to apply a load on the X and the Y direction on the system, you know, in a biaxial manner. And from the loading arrangement here, you'll notice that the part that is really interesting is basically this green part, this light green part, because what this is showing us is, is that the system will be expanding and contracting only as a consequence of this because of the nature of the loading. So in essence, it means that this becomes almost like a plain problem, a 2D problem, which is represented basically this way. So from henceforth, we're going to carry on with this analysis based on this 2D problem. And the system that we're going to study is a voided aluminum system where the circles, the white little circles here represent the voids and the regions in green are the aluminum material. And what we want to do here is to apply a load at this corner node, applying a displacement in the X and the Y direction, and also connect those displacement to the surfaces that are shown in this case, and also holding the back end to create a roller supported system to create this biaxial deformation. The kind of result we'll get will be this sort of result, in which case you notice that the system is being expanding in this way and expanded in that way. There is a concentration accumulation of plastic strain in the material, and then you begin to see this. Uh, voids also agglomerating, coalescing, forming a united a uniform system. And so these are the kind of things that this sort of simulation is really useful for, for assessing, for example, the coalescence of voids. So this is the kind of thing that we are working. I'm going to be showing you how to do in this video. At the end also, I'll be showing you how to generate a biaxial plot based on stress strain representation of the same system. So we have not only the contour plot, but also a quantitative representation of the behavior of the system. If this is the kind of thing that you're interested and then sit back and relax so that we can go into video so that I can show you in more detail how to go about this. So like I said, the domain that we're going to work with is basically a voided aluminium domain and those are the voids. And it's got a length of 100 by 100 millimeters according to the dimension that we're studying here. And the void configuration here is such that the voids are essentially represented as circles because it's a 2D problem. And all these circles are uniform diameter circle so it's a mono dispersed system and then if we look a little bit more the diameter configuration the diameter of, of dimension 50 millimeters and the void volume fraction for the system that we're working with is 35 percent and also the voids are distributed randomly using a Monte Carlo style method so that's what we are going to work with of course the question is how on earth do we actually generate this sort of Behavior. And that leads us to this software that I developed called Multical Gen 2D. It generates a 2D representative volume element with either voids or particles. And if you're interested in getting hold of this software, please look at the link at the top here that will explain to you how to get hold of this software. Essentially, what this Monte Carlo chain will do is that apart from dealing with the issue of Monte Carlo generation, which is this randomized generation of the system, it also produces a Python script which will help you take whatever Monte Carlo gen has generated to you and implement that inside Abacus, which is obviously what anyone is really going to be interested in. And, and essentially what with that script, you have to then run it inside Abacus and then you generate the domain like we've shown in this instance. Of course, you can also do this by hand. And obviously, depending on the complexity of the domain, it may become a little bit more difficult for you. If you're interested in doing this by hand, then look at this video where I showed how you can sort of from first principle begin to build up the system without having to resort to a software like this. Now, the material system that we're going to be studying here is obviously aluminum, like I said. So I'm focusing just on the post yield behavior so you get a, get a, some kind of post yield softening on the material and this is just the post yield behavior the young's model is 75 gigapascal and Poisson ratio is 0.33 and of course these are the properties in the post yield behavior that we're going to bring into the model and go ahead and study the system now specifically how do we actually prescribe the biaxial loading on a system that looks like this and the first thing we need to do is we need to find a reference point at the left bottom hand corner which i've called x reference point here there will also be another y reference point at this corner because these are the two corners that we're going to use to apply our load and then obviously we apply a displacement load and if we apply a displacement load in the x direction for a uniax the pure uniax of the formation along the x axis it means that we also need to apply a roller supported uh, on the x pack this phase is called the x pack phase or the x pack edge of the system so if we hold the back and then we can pull the front, that creates a uniaxial, one of the uniaxial response 
and then similarly in the y direction we also need to apply a load a displacement load in the y direction and also hold the back end here to again create a uniaxial deformation in that direction and when the two things are happening in c2 then we end up with a biaxial deformation where the system is deforming in the x and also deforming in the y as shown here we also need to identify this face which is the x front face or x front edge and the y front edge as well y top edge because we're going to use it later on but we need to identify the boundary edges that make up this domain but this is sort of how you're going to apply the load on a system to create the deformation that we're interested in then the next thing we need to think about here is how do we actually translate the loading that we're applying on this corner to these surfaces so that we then have a homogeneous deformation of the front surface and also a homogeneous deformation of the top surface and this leads us to the idea of what is called a kinematic coupling of the system and essentially what it means is that we are going to find a way to link the behavior of the system to everything on these faces so it's almost like there is a loose connection between this reference point and the edges on the system and the idea is that the deformation of this node or this reference point must match the deformation of that and we introduce a canonical equation that will do that and this is sort of what a canonical equation in this case i'm working with displacement which is u so the displacement of the x front face which is our x front edge in this case in the one direction minus the displacement of the reference node in the same y direction should be equal to zero which means that they are basically equal and this is a canonical equation that would prescribe the uniform deformation of the system i'll show you how this is done also inside of abacus the same thing applies on the top end the deformation of this end has to be linked up to that using again another canonical equation where we are focusing on the two axes which is the y axis you would ask why do i go into all this detail in order to you know prescribe this load with this way and the reason really is that subsequently i'm going to track only what's happening as the reference point nodes in the x and the y because then from there we can also track the values it makes their post analysis very easy because then you're not going to have to track all the elements that make up the system but you're only tracking those two points it's a very you know, memory you know, excellent way to handle the behavior of the system so basically in terms of post view behavior what i'm going to be tracking here will be the deformation in the one axis and the reaction force in the one axis of this node only and the same thing in the two axis and the reaction force in the two axis of that node only and with that we can then find out what the stress would be in the x direction for example so it will be the reaction force in that one direction divided by the area in the x axis which will be on that face the strain will be the displacement divided by the length and the length being the length of the system like this okay so with that information what then do we end up doing so what we end up finding is that there is a new value that we introduce here which is this AX and this AX is a bit unusual because we have only segments of the area represented here rather than the full area and so when we're applying our forces their forces are actually attached only to those segments unlike in this case where our displacement is actually across the whole length here we're only interested in that segment alone so how do we define X now the area XX is the product of the X front length so the X front length being what I've called LX here times the depth or and the assumed unit depth. So we're going to assume a unit depth of this problem. And, and this is typically what you do when you have uh, when you are trying to analyze a system that is 2D and you want to extract area. So you also assume a unit depth because in the end, if you multiply by one, it doesn't really change anything. So where LX in this case is basically the sum of all the comprising length on the X front. So basically, if you have the L1, L2 and L3, so our LX will be the sum across the number of segments that make up this system and that gives you the total length. So if we are doing it on the Y axis, it will only be this and that. So two lengths involved. And once we find this LX, then the area will be that LX times the unit depth of one and that gives us the area and with that area we divide it by the reaction force in the one axis and that gives us the stress and that's how we do a post yield analysis of the system so that's the theory behind what we're trying to do now we're going to go into a so that i can actually show you in detail how you can set up this model and how you can do all that has been described in the so far if this is the kind of content that you like please i do encourage you to subscribe to this youtube channel so that when contents like this are made you'll be the first to see it i also want to highlight that 
There is a CM Videos Insider Group, which I regularly send every week newsletters talking about behind the scenes in CM Videos and more about products that are available on the CM Videos website. I also publish in this newsletter reflections from my perspective on a lot of computational modeling issues. If you are interested in this kind of thing, please do subscribe to newsletter. You'll also be able to read up to 100 articles already published on that newsletter. Thank you. So like we said, what we want to do is we want to create this domain and I'm going to have to use MonteCalGen to create it. And MonteCalGen, like we said, will output for us a Python script that we're going to look at. So let's just have a look at a typical Python script that comes from our setup. So I've used MonteCalGen and I've generated the Python script. If you are interested in learning how MonteCalGen works, then this is a video that can actually explain to you in more detail about what it is. But that's not the object of this video. So what we have here is basically the Python script that comes from this by default it will produce a particular text system you know in this case an audi composite which we are going to tweak so at the top and it gives us a little bit of information of what it's trying to do and then as usual with any abacus style python script it will create these object libraries and then here it creates the metrics it's create a viewport and then all the reinforcing inclusions which in this case it would represent or avoid it creates them in independently and then it goes ahead to create the metric section mesh them so all that is generated automatically from Monte Carlo gen so we are going to then just click a to select all and copy so Ctrl A to select all and Ctrl C to copy and then we'll go into Abacus. So here we are in Abacus. So we need to go to the kernel command window, which here, this line interface, and then we're just going to paste what we've copied. So what it will do now is that it will go ahead and try to generate the the of the system that we have in mind and we already have that here. So first thing I will do, so if I so first thing I'll do is to rename this. So voided aluminum RV. And clearly, I don't want it to be. So if you look at what we have here, so clearly it's basically looking in this form and we don't want that. So what we are going to do is that we're going to go to the assembly module. And within the assembly module, I'm going to regenerate these two cases. So if I resume them, so they come back alive and then I can delete the composite version of that. So now we have a two system and we can then do the voiding arrangement of that. So we're going to use this. So if I click this and then I have to give it a name. So the name of this model will be voided alum RVE. So let's call it that. And we're going to use a cutting operation and we're suppressing the instances. So what it first tell us select the instance we want to cut. So basically it's the aluminum that we want to cut and what are the other instances that we want to make the cut with so we can easily select all the parts by drawing a box around it and click OK. So instantly we now have the system that we're interested in with avoided systems. So we can then easily go back to the top here and delete the originally generated model which came from Multicalgen. So we've got a clear system. Everything looks all right here. Now we can then go ahead and do some you know some some kind of study on the system by first trying to create the set that we want so i'm going to call my x front the x front set so i basically need to switch these to edges and then switch these two by angle so that once i hover around here okay and then x back so with the x back while pressing down shift we can select all the edges that make up the back and then click done so we'll do the same thing with the top so y top so press down shift and select what makes up the top and then the same thing with the base so x base so i press down shift and then I select what makes up the base and that's fine so now this way we've got everything represented so if i switch to set so it shows you all the clear clearly what the sets that make up the systems look like now we can then go ahead and look at what the material system is so i'm going to delete this because we're not interested in the glass so the polypropylene that came by default i'm going to call it aluminium so with the aluminium we look at what the numbers are so clearly it's, it's always a blank system which left for us to put in what we want so our elastic behavior would be 75 e to power 3 0 0.33 because we are working in a unit of millimeters. So again, if you're interested in understanding the unit system in Abacus, then this is a video that can help you with that. So if you look at the plasticity system, so with the plasticity, so we need to put in all these numbers. So if I copy these numbers the way they are, 
and then we can then paste them here so it comes in so we've got a plastic behavior we've got our elastic behavior and the materials are fine so if we then look at this section so again i'll delete the a glass and then i'll change this i rename it and i call it the aluminium section so i'll just call it alum section so the aluminium section and then we can then go ahead and do a section assignment so if i select that on tick this Basically, on the whole section, we assign it with the aluminum section that we want. Okay, so with the aluminum, we attach it to what we have here, and then we can go ahead and work on that. So that when we switch the materials, everything looks fine. Then we can explore meshing the domain. So if we double click here, so I'm going to, okay, let's probably use something 1.35 or even something less. So let's probably work with one, a unit of one, one across the system, and then we'll probably use a triangular system to mesh this and then we can mesh the domain and everything looks fine so it, it probably looks quite fine but we can work with that because we're going to expect that there will be some kind of failure you know high high stress region and so we want to get a very good result now the next thing we need to do here so if we go to the assembly module now we need to introduce some kind of reference point that we need so if i click here so there's a reference point that will be here remember this system is 100 by 100 so the reference point will be 100 on the x axis and zero on the y so we've got a reference point there and we need something like that at the top so zero on the x axis and 100 on the y so we've got those two reference points and then if we go to the futures we can then basically rename them so this will be x reference point and then the other one will be y reference point okay so we've got all, all of them and then we need to create a set basically for them so if i right click here so i'm going to call my x reference point set so for example if that's what we want and then we name that so this is a way of naming those reference points so that we can call them later on so the same thing here so y reference point set so that will be the y axis so we select that so we've named them now we can work our way still through while going through the system here to create a loading step. So our loading step, I'm going to work with a static generator, but of course you can use also a dynamic SPC depending on what simulation you're trying to do. We need to create a history output. So, and there'll be two history output because we're going to track these bags that respond. So I'm going to call my X axis history output. Okay. And that will be linked to that reference point that we named, which is XRP. And this is where we say we're only interested in reaction force one and displacement one. So we'll do the same for the y-axis so y history output so again we are going to track only the y point reaction force 2 and u2 so that we have a very clean you know data in our history variable that we can analyze without messing up and you know tracking all the elements that make up in the system so we've got everything set up then the next thing is we need to create a constraint because we need to hold the back and the front but let's create the constraint first so i'm going to call my x equation so let's call it x equation and we're going to use a star equation to create those canonical functions so we have the coefficient of one here and the x axis that we're working with here will be the x front so we've got the x front degree of freedom one degree of freedom one and it's linked to the reaction force and that will be minus one so basically you're looking at displacement of this minus displacement of this equal to zero in the one direction so that becomes the connection between this and what happens there. So we'll do the same thing for y equation. Again, in the equation, you so we've got one minus one. So we're displacing what's happening on the y top with respect to the y reference point set in the two direction according to this equation. And then we have that as well. So we've got all this loading that we need to think about our boundary condition. So remember, we want to fix the back. So, so x back has to be roller supported and its initial boundary condition based on displacement so i'm just going to find the set so x back highlight that so it shows me my back i'm constraining that in the one direction so that the system as i apply the load here that is held so we'll do the same for the y base roller and that will be based on the y okay so i've called it x base which should be really y base which is fine so we'll continue with that and then we're constraining it in the two direction and that's fine so we've got the boundary conditions on the system now we've also got the con constraint equation you know as they are connected as they're supposed to be the final thing is just to apply our displacement so our displacement in this case will be x tension so 
and that will be based on a loading step. So we're going to attach it to the X reference point and then that will be a 10 millimeters. So I'm applying a 10% displacement on this system. So it's got an edge length of 100, 10% of that will be 10. So, and that represents the loading in this direction. So we'll do the same thing for the Y tension. So with the Y tension, again, Y reference point and we want to also do it in the two direction, apply a 10% displacement. If you want to assess the compressive behavior of the system, then you need to change the direction of this and see like a dilation <coughs> hydrostatic effect where the forces are creating a compressive behavior on the system. But that's not what we're looking for here. So we're only interested in the biaxial tensile deformation. So all the all that is required is set up properly in this model. We've got all of our setup. The only thing we now need to do is to set the job to run. So let's just look at the one that I've already done before. All right, so let's look at the results that we have obtained based on this. And basically this is what it shows you. So based on the loading that I applied on system. So let's just activate all the boundary conditions involved. We'll go to view ODP display option. And within here, so under entity, we're going to allow this to show and just tell it to show boundary condition and apply. So basically you could see what it's trying to show. So we've got this point anchored on the reference point, pulling this system this way and pulling that system that way, creating a biaxial deformation. And that top end is being deforming as well as this other end is deforming, thereby imposing a true biaxiality in the system as is desired. And right from the beginning, you could see the accumulation of plastic strain in some regions building up. You can see these two uh, voids also almost agglomerating together, coalescing together. And this is one of the things you study with this kind of study, which is the coalescence of voids as the walls in dividing them fell and then the two begin to connect. Also, you find re regions of weakness in the system around here leading to failure. Of course, the next thing here is how can we get some quantitative data on the system? And that's what we're going to do next. And the first thing we need to do is to go to the history variable here and track the history. Incidentally, when we're setting up the model, we ask for setting history variables. And so that's our reaction force based on XRP and YRP and also the displacement. So if you just go ahead and plot. Now, this is sort of result we're getting. So it gives us the, this nice force time history and displacement history because we're applying the same displacement all through. There is no distinguishing between those two displacement data. But basically, we've got all the data here. So we are going to then do some manipulation on this by taking this data into Excel and do our post-processing. So how do we do that? So if we go to Plugin Tools Excel Utility, I'm just going to ask it to give me the current plot, all of it at once. Okay, so this is the data that we have generated, exported directly. And instantly, what it means is that this first point is the time and the reaction force one time react so that's what we've got here and then in the end so what we're going to do that we're just going to leave the first time because all these other values the time are the same so they are not if you look at them they're the same so we don't really need to keep repeating them so i'm going to delete that and then that leaves me with our time reaction force one reaction force two u1 and u2 so i'll do control a and control c to copy all of that i've already prepared um so this is an excel template that i've already prepared that i'm going to make available for you in the description section of this video for helping you with the analysis here so the data that i've come collected will just paste them here and instantly you know it accepts them it accepts them and generates the plot of x1 x stress and y stress for us so we can then go ahead and study what's happening here so basically the strain here in the one one direction basically is this displacement divided by the length in, of that region which is 100 like we already know so the same thing the y strain is again the displacement in two direction divided by that length now if we look what's going on here so if we study the system here we need to find this area and i will come back to that in a moment but basically in terms of the stress so if you look at what's happening here so we've got the reaction force divided by the stress the area cross-sectional area in the x direction so reaction force one divided by area in that x direction and the same thing here the reaction force divided by the area what i've done here is to just add a really minuscule numerical value to the simulation just so that when let, later on i start evaluating this um, triaxiality stress ratio or biaxiality ratio of the ratio between s1 and s2 i won't get zero divided by zero so rather i will end up having 0 0.001 divided by 0 0.001 so it doesn't really make anything it doesn't change it's just a number that is a little bit 
different from that is non-zero but very very small it's quite common to do this when you're doing some kind of numerical computation the other next thing is to just exclude that value in your simulation but you know what as well do what i've done here and so that's why we we added this tiny amount to our simulation then obviously the next thing is how on earth do we get this remember we talked about this that what we need is to find the total length of these regions and then if we can find all these lengths, then we just sum them all up and then we, have, we get our value. And so that's what we're going to do. So you can do it, you know, automatically, but I want to show you how you can do this manually. So that takes us back into Abacus. So within the assembly module, so we can use this button which says, you know, query the information. So we're going to look for the distance. Okay, so I'm going to open up here and then I'm going to switch it to this environment. So open up the distance. So we want to distance from here to there. So it gives us what that distance is. It said the point is made up of 12.8982. So I could go ahead and then put that first one. So this is equal to, so paste that plus. So we can go ahead and do the next one. So we click on here and click on there. So it gives us another value of 15 point, whatever that value is. So we can go here and paste that value. And then we can then finally do the last one, which is this to that. So it gives us 33 point whatever so we collect that data and then we'll paste it as well here so when you do that so you can see it gives us this 1.49 this and we have it there so we can do the same thing for the y-axis as well so this way we found all the lengths associated with the system so that way we are able to generate our areas and that use it on this so we get a biaxial plot which looks like this and basically it does show some really interesting things that in terms of the x-axis you've got a, a higher value of yield stress in the x direction compared to the y direction so while this is around 95 this one is around 75 so they say nearly 20 megapascal difference between what's happening in the x and the y direction and why is that so and and the reason is because of essentially the distribution of the voids okay and also the difference in the areas of contact so we've got an area of contact there and another area of contact here so there's a lesser area of contact here compared to that region and so we, when you're dividing with a lesser area then you have a higher stress compared to this region where there is more area which leads to lower stress so there are all these variables that come come to play in the system if this was a homogeneous system where there is really no voiding at all then we expect those two plots to be right on top of each other and then just to go ahead and plot the biaxial stress ratio plot we were looking at sigma you know one one against as a function of time so it gives us a, a value like this normally it should be one and then goes on continuously but it gives us some interesting things which again for a different kind of study you may be interested in what's going on here if you want to see how this is done in three dimension especially if you're looking at triaxial loading then this is a, a video that can show you how you do exactly what i've done but with the triaxial loading thank you for your interest in this channel and i'll see you in the next bye bye <music>